is an Israeli politician and former Neset member for Meharet. Born Saeed Kahan in Baghdad, Iraq, Kahan was 13 years old when he immigrated to Israel through Iran. He Hebraized his first name after his arrival in Israel, renaming himself Ran. He grew up in the kibbutz Gan Shemuel, where he absorbed socialist and Zionist ideology. During his military service, he rose to the rank of Colonel Aluf Mishni. After the military, he obtained a B.A. in philosophy and in economics at Tel Aviv. So we have this man right here. He was born a Baghdad Jew. He was not a white European Jew. He was an Iraqi Jew. And he was not Ashkenazi. Okay, we see in his political career, he was elected as the secretary of Kibbutz in Gan Shomiel, and he was first elected to the Neset as the member of the Rat, head of the Shalomit Aloni, after the head of the Cap Left, Cap of Israel Peace Movement. Starting in 1992, he served as the member of Maharetz and Dovish left-wing party, which resulted in the merger of the Mapan, Ratz, and Shinui. He was later Minister of the Industry and Trade in Ehud, Barak's government. He headed several Neset committees, including the Secretary of Foreign Affairs. So we see that this guy, Cohen, was no joke. As, as his career today, he is the chairman of the Standard Institute of Israel. What is the Standard Institute of Israel? It is a state-owned corporation responsible for the setting standards for products and services provided in Israel. He is the chairman of this company, this corporation today. And originally, he was a part of the government. He was a Jew from Iraq. He's a part of the military. And he was a part of the government. Rand Cohen is familiar with these kind of reliefs of these black men in Iraq. These are ancient Iraqi reliefs of the Syrians with the black Israelites. Look at these black men stretched out like in a cross position way before Jesus ever even died on the cross. These are black men who were dying in crossly figures way back before Jesus was ever even heard of. These were black folk. Rand Cohen was from this place where this art and this history was known. listening to Yasha in Israel, right? And the information that he was putting forth, right? I was really listening um, to the information that he was putting forth. And as I was listening to it, I was just like, wow, when is he going to get to the point where debunk anything that I said? So, a mestico in colonial Brazil was initially used to refer to the Mamalucos, who were persons born from a couple in which one was an indigenous American and the other a European. It literally translates as Mamaluke, end quote, probably referring to the common Iberian comparisons of swarthy people to North Africans. <laughs> so... A mestico in colonial Brazil was initially used to refer to the Mamalucos, who were persons born from a couple in which one was an indigenous American and the other a European. It literally translates as Mamaluk, end quote, probably referring to the common Iberian comparisons of swarthy people to North Africans, i.e. Moreno, Tawny, Swarthy, or Tan. But 
i.e. Moreno, Tawny, Swarthy, or Tan, but also dark-colored or dark-haired human from Muro or Moor. You guys see how these terms are starting to, it's starting, y'all starting to see it now? Now in Brazil, the word... Are you all starting to see it now? Are you starting to see how these words are starting to work now? Are you starting to see that? Now let's see what's going on here. This is what the Britannica has to say about the Mumluks. It says there's a universal agreement amongst historians that the Mumluk state reached its height under the Turkic Sultans and then fell into a prolonged phase of decline under the Sarkasians. Okay? Now, you see, you're talking about the, the Mumluk state. Okay? Now, we're going to show you who the, the, the Circassians were. Circassians, Russian Circs, or Circas, plural, Circassi, member of a Caucasian people, speaking a Northwest Caucasian language. Chris Harris doesn't know what the hell he's talking about here. Chris Harris, I repeat, does not know what the hell he's talking about here. The Mumluks <laughs> were a Caucasian people. Mamluk. As one who is owned, meaning slave, also transliterated as Mam Mamluk. Mamluk, Mamluk. Mamluk, 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 Mamluk is a term mostly common referring to non-Arab ethnicity, diversity, mostly Turkic, Caucasian, Eastern, and Southern European. See right here where it says the Bahri Mumluks were mainly natives of the Southern Russia and the Burgi comprise chiefly of Circassians from the Caucasus. This man is crazy trying to pass the Berbers off as a mix, I mean, the, uh, the moon looks off as a mixed people or even a tawny or a black or a swarthy people. That's misinformation all day. listening to Yasha in Israel, right? And the information that he was putting forth, right? I was really listening um, to the information that he was putting forth. And as I was listening to it, I was just like, wow, when is he going to get to the point where debunk anything that I said? Is our Damata. Now, why is this significant? Because it's showing our interaction with the Portuguese people and their interaction with us and how these customs and these oral traditions would happen. You guys are going to love what I present next. Now, this is um, by Tobias Green. This um, was called Equal Partners Proselytizing by Africans and Jews in the 17th Century Atlantic Diaspora. Now, the research has been very revealing. The Sephardim in question originated from Amsterdam, see where I'm going, people, and belonged to the group of new Christians who had sought religious sanctuary in the Dutch United Provinces. And you see this, people? Listen real carefully to what this guy is saying here. Return to their ancestral faith. Their presence in Senegambia was related to, to the trade in wax and hides in which the region specialized in these years. The community grew to be quite sizable in the second decade of the 17th century, running its own prayer meetings with the help of, quote, excuse me, I'm going to quote it, Torahs imported from Europe 
and having ritual butchers who killed meat according to the laws of Kosh root. However, following a disastrous training ex trading expedition in 1612 led by the community's leader, Jacob Peregrino, the Sephardic community in Senegal fell into a long decline, which it never recovered. All right, so here it is. They're in the West Coast of Africa. They're proselytizing. They're teaching Africans about jewelry. Africans are teaching this to their children. They're mixing with African women. The African women are teaching their kids. This is how you get these people calling themselves Jews. But then when we go look into it, we can't find Yahweh worship nowhere prior to them getting there. I'm going to deal with all of that. Let's continue. Well, you're going to deal with that after I deal with you. You see right here, he's talking about a Jewish community that was in Western Africa. And it talked about, as you, as you can see it right there, it talks about uh, it, was a, it was a Jewish community. It was a, it was a disaster that occurred in a trading explosion right there in 1612. And it was led by the community's leader, Jacob, of the uh, Sephardic community in Senegal. Okay? In Senegal fell into a long decline, which it never recovered from. All it was talking about was the other Jewish community in Senegambia, in Senegal, black folks, a Jewish community that fell, and this Jewish community was black folks. He's trying to make it, though, as though these people were white folks, as though they were European, and this is where he is wrong at. And this is where I am going to prove him in great error. Here he stated this is where the community fell into a decline. And this is where he was uh, trying to pass off that these were Portuguese white people who came into Africa. And that were converting black people into Judaism. And this is where he was in the great era. Jewelry. Africans are teaching this to their children. They're mixing with African women. The African women are teaching their kids. This is how you get these people calling themselves Jews. But then when we go look into it, we can't find Yahweh worship nowhere prior to them getting there. I'm going to deal with all of that. Let's continue on. He also stated that there was no Jews in Africa prior to them getting there. He was basically saying that this period right here, the 17th century, okay, he was, so basically, he said there's two things that I'm going to prove wrong here. He said that there was no Jews getting there, uh, getting there prior to the 17th century, because this is the era that he's talking about, as you can see clearly right there up on the screen, okay. And then he then he's trying to act though as though these were white Jews that were coming into Western Africa, white Portuguese, white Europeans, okay, that were passing off themselves as <laughs> they were white Europeans passing themselves off, you know, as 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 African. When you can clearly read right here that these were Jewish converts who were passing themselves off as Portuguese. And in the, in the text right here tell you that it was unrightfully so. It was done unrightfully so. You understand? It tells you right there in the text. You see? So I'm going to prove him wrong right now. This, this is the black Jewish thesis. Revisited by Ron Cohane, okay, Department of Literature, Tel Aviv University, okay, at uh at Yofo, Israel. Okay, this is in June 2018 to July 2018. Okay. He said, abstract the notion that in previous centuries, Jews were considered to be black or seen as blacks has gained broad 
acceptance in scholarly discourse on the Jewish body since the early 1990s. The present article considers the notion analytically and then explains some of the evidence provided to support it. Much of the evidence does not stand critical examination. Therefore, arguably, the notion of Jewish blackness should be reconsidered. Okay? This now look here. Look at this problem here. It said that the notion that in the previous century Jews were considered to be black or seen as black has gained broad acceptance in scholarly discourse. But yet and still, Chris Harris does not accept this. That's the problem because it, it, it clearly he said that it has gained broad acceptance in scholarly discourse that Jews were seen as black. But this clown, this fool wouldn't accept it. You see? So let's continue. This is the crux of the hookup here. He said that the notion of Jewish blackness, the, the notion of blackness of the Jews or Jewish blackness have gained commonplace in scholarly discourse, going back to the path-breaking work of Sanders L. Gilman in the late 1980s. Scholars often assert that the strong European tradition dating back to the Middle Ages maintained that the Jews were black, or at least swarthy, and find sharp expression in modern anti-Semitic literature. That in medieval literature, and therefore prevailed in which the Jews were part of the black race or were at least dark-skinned. Or that the general look of the Jews was considered to be like that of the black. We're looking for bus parfait. Okay, Shiva, 2000. You see my references. I shouldn't even have to read them because they're there. The article was meant as a caveat or a question mark on the prevailing notion. One issue with the notion is ambiguity. Jewish blackness sometimes means that the Jews were quite literally seen as black, which is a matter of color, but more often, more provocative sense is implied. Namely that in the eyes of the non-Jew who define them, in Western society, the Jew becomes the blacks. Let's scroll on down to some of his work here. And unless we're going to go back to what Portuguese Jews look like. Okay. And this article is by an Iraqi Jew. Okay. Are we examining the evidence here? The earliest is Francois Maximilian Maison in 1650-1722, whose ideas influenced Buffon's natural history. Maison's travel guide to Italy is quoted in the English translation of 1714 so we going back from uh, 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 the, uh, the 1650s in which this was quoted it said this is a vulgar era that the Jews are all black for this is only true for the Portuguese Jews again and back in the 1600s Francois Maximilian Maison said, This is a vulgar era, that the Jews are all black, for this is only true for the Portuguese Jews, who, marrying always amongst 
one another, begat children like themselves, and consequently, the swarthiness of their complexion is entailed upon their whole race, even in the southern regions. But the Jews who were originally in Germany, those, for example, I have seen a plague, are not blacker than the rest of their countrymen. Francois Maximilian Maison, originally Francois Maximilian Maison, 1650, 12th of January, 1722, was a French writer and traveler. And he was a traveler, so he, and he was a writer, so he, it was his job to write. And he wrote what he saw. And he was a traveler, so he traveled all around and he wrote the things that he saw. He was born in Lyon, he fled France at the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685 and settled in Britain. He traveled throughout Italy during 18, 1687 and 1688, and in 1691 published the Nouveau Voyage d'Italie, which was to be the standard travel guide to Italy for the following 50 years. In 1698, he published the second work, Memoirs et Observations, Fait part un voyager in Angleterre. And in 1708, his final book, The Voyage to the East, Indeed. These were the men that were given these descriptions of black Jews from Portugal. George, Louis, Leclerc, Monte de Buffon. September 1707-1611. 1788 was a French naturalist, a mathematician, a cosmologist, and an encyclopedia. I told y'all that these were prolific writers of the Enlightenment age, and they were telling you that the Portuguese Jews were black people. Okay? His work influenced the next two generations of naturalists, including two prominent French scientists, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck and Georges Cuvier. Buffon published 32 quarto volumes of his Hystère Naturelle during his lifetime, with additional volumes based on his notes and further research during being published excuse me, in two decades following his death. We can see here Ernest Mayer wrote that truly Buffon was the father of all thought in natural history in the second half of the 18th century. In natural history. In natural history. He was the father of all thought in natural history. And this man said that the Portuguese Jews was black in the second half of the 18th century credited with being one of the first naturalists to recognize ecological secession. He was later forced by the Theology Committee at the University of Paris to recant this theory about the geological history and animal evolution because they contradicted the biblical narrative of creation. Buffon held the position, the position of Intendant Director at the Jardin du Roy, now called the Jardin Jess Plantis. In his early life, I'm going to get a little bit past his early life here, where he, where he attended the Jesuit College of uh, Godrens in Dijon. 
from the age of 10 onward. Wow, so he was in college at 10 years old. He studied law, mathematics at the University of Angers in France. Very interesting in his career. In 1732, he moved to Paris where he made the acquaintance of Voltaire and other intellectuals. He lived in Faubourg, St. Germany, with Giles Francois Balduc, first apothecary of the king, professor of chemistry at the Royal Garden of Plants, member of the Academy of Science. He first made his mark in the field of mathematics and in the Sur de Jordi Fran. Frank Curio on the game of fair square, introduced differentials in integral calculus into probable theory. The problem of Buffon's needle is probably theory and named after him. And in 1734, he was admitted to the French Academy of Sciences. During this period, he corresponded with the Smith, with the Swiss mathematician Gabriel Kramer. As we can see here, this man was a very intelligent man. He was a very prolific writer. And he was the one who said that the Jews were black. The Portuguese Jews. Sixteen fifty to seventeen twenty two. Whose ideas influenced Buffon's natural history of seventeen fourteen? This is also a vulgar error that the Jews are all black, for this is only true for the Portuguese Jews who marrying always amongst one another begat children like themselves. They marry always amongst each other, and they were black, and they begat children like, them, and them, like themselves and all around the world, no matter where they went, whether it was Africa, whether it was Spain, whether it was Europe, and consequently, the swarthiness of their complexion is entailed upon their whole race. They said they were black, okay? They were swarthy, even in the northern regions. But, in, but the Jews who are originally of Germany, those, for example, I have seen at Prague, are not blacker than the rest of their countrymen. It has been pretended that the Jews who, who is this? This is also from my son's work. Okay. Yeah, this is Buffon's These work. These are my son's. This is Buffon's work right here, as we can see. You know, in, in, the, in his monumental Historio Naturel, a highly influential work translated in all major languages, European languages, Buffon wrote this in an accurate English translation that... Words. He said, it has been pretended that the Jews who originally from Syria and Palestine came have the same brown complexion they have had formerly as my son. However, justly observed the Jews of Portugal alone are tawny, and they always marry with their own tribe. The complexion of their parents is transmitted to the children, and thus with little demutation, preserved even in the northern countries. The German Jews, those of Prague, for example, are not more swarthy than the other Germans. So these are different interpretations of that particular statement. Another evidence is that of James Cross Picard, who in 1808, commented on the Jews' caloric and melancholic temperaments, so that they have, in general, a shade of complexion somewhat darker than that of the English people. 
Congress, quoting Pichard, 1830. Again, Pichard refers to the particular English Jews, not to the Jews in general, but being somewhat darker than the English is hardly sufficient to make one black. In fact, one could have blue eyes and flaxen hair and still be darker than the English, as Picard himself wrote elsewhere. The Jews have assimilated in physical characters to have nations amongst whom they have long resided, st though still to be recognized by some minute peculiarities and physiognomy in the northern countries of Europe, they are fair or xanthous. Blue eyes or flaxen hair are seen in English Jews and in some parts of Germany, and red beards and Jews are very conspicuous. But he says here the Jews of Portugal They're are very, very dark. dark. The Jews of Portugal. We talked about the blackness of the Jews here in 1843. This is what Pichard said. A different case is the description of the typical Viennese Jews of his time by the Bavarian Enlightenment writer. These are Enlightenment writers. Jahan and Pezzi, 1756-1823. Eight lines and two, the long, non Continuous citation that opens with there are about 500 Jews in Vienna. Pezzi is quoted saying, Excluding the Indian fakirs, there are no contemporary of supposed human beings which come closer to the orangutan than does a Polish Jew. Remember how Chris Harris talked about he don't like how people talk down upon his people and how his black people and his culture and, the, and and these black people that lived in huts or whatever, where they were looked at as orangutan. He said none was looked down upon like the orangutan uh, uh, or, the, or, the Portuguese, or the Polish Jew covered from head, covered from head to toe in filth and dirt and rags, just like how you mentioned Chris Harris. Covered in a type of black sack, their necks exposed, the color of a black, the color of a black, the color of a black, their faces covered up to their eyes with the beards. Gil. And you're a Jew, or if you're something like that. And rightfully so, because whenever they showed us pictures of West Africa, or maybe Africa in general, we was always in we was always in rattered and tattered clothing. They made it look like we were living in mud huts. My biggest problem with that is so what? Embrace it. That's who we are. So what if we were in mud huts? It's very ethnocentric of somebody to try and talk about us as if it wasn't good enough for us. Now, I'm not saying that's how our communities and our civilizations were, because I do know that we are the mothers, fathers, daughters, sons, nieces, nephews, grandchildren of the greatest civilizations on Earth. Two, I don't want to hear anybody else talking about Egypt as if Egypt was the capital of Africa or as if it was the oldest civilization. A different case is the description of the typical Viennese Jews of his time by the Bavarian Enlightenment writer. These are Enlightenment writers. Jahan and Pezzi, 1756-1823. Eight lines and two, the long, non-continuous citation that opens with there are about 500 Jews in Vienna. Pezzi is quoted saying, Excluding the Indian fakirs, there are no contemporary of supposed human beings which come closer to the orangutan than does a Polish Jew. Remember how Chris Harris talked about he don't like how people talk down upon his people and how his black people and his culture and, the, and, and these black people that lived in huts or whatever where they were looked at as orangutan. He said none was looked down upon like the orangutan uh, uh, or, the, or, the Portuguese, or the Polish Jew, covered from head covered from head to toe in filth and dirt and rags, just like how you mentioned, Chris Harris, covered in a type of black sack, their necks 
exposed the color of a black, the color of a black, the color of a black, their faces covered up to their eyes with the beard. Guilt. I was listening to Yasha in his room, right? No, you wouldn't. And the information that he was putting forth, right? I was really listening um, to the information that he was putting forth. And as I was listening to it, I was just like, wow, when is he going to get to the point where he bumped anything that I said? Emily Gottwright. You see that's right there, Berkeley University, California. CMS, Center for Middle Eastern Studies, University of California, Ber Berkeley. Emily Gottwright, a staff, visiting scholars, distinguished visitors, school advisory committee, and librarians. Emily Gottwright, adjunct professor, Global Studies and Department of History Senior Research Scholar and Program Director of MENA, J, and CMES. What is CMES? CMES is the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Okay? She is the senior director, senior research scholar, okay, at CMS. That's Emily Godwright. Emily, God, Emily Godwright is an adjunct professional, excuse me, Emily Godwright is an adjunct professor in global studies and in the Department of History and academic coordinator for the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Between 2009 and 2013, she was the president of the American Institute for Maghrib Studies. She is also the founding director of, along with Amor Baum, UCLA, and Susan Miller, and UC Davis of the Mena J and Mena Jewelry Program, a UC statewide initiative to study, document, and preserve Jewish history in the Middle East and North Africa. Professor Godwright received a PhD in history and Middle Eastern Studies from Harvard University in 1999 and a MA in Middle Eastern Studies from Harvard University in 1992 and a BA in Middle Eastern Studies from UA Berkeley in 1989. Her research focused on Moroccan Jewish history and Muslim Jewish relations and broader Arabic Islamic context. Courses taught by God right include Jews and Muslims, North African history, culture and society, scope and methods of research in MES, survey of the world history, and senior thesis in MES. Publication she's wrote, Jewish Morocco, A History of Pre-Islamic to Post-Colonial Times, published by London, I.B. Torres, 2002, The Mela of Marrakesh, Jewish and Muslim Space in Morocco, Red City, Bloomington, Indiana University Press, 2007, Jewish Culture and Society in North Africa, co-edited by Daniel Schroeter. Bloomington, Indiana, University Press, 2011, of Messiahs and Sotan, Sabatai Levi in Early Modernity in Morocco, in Sites of Jewish Memory, Jews in and from Islamic Lands in Modern Times, London, Bruich, 2014, Historicizing the Concept of Arabic Jews in the Maghreb. Jewish Quarterly Review, 2008. Wow, this lady right here has uh, quite
quite a big, awesome resume, and she is an expert in the field. All right, so here it is. They're in the West Coast of Africa. They're proselytizing. They're teaching Africans about jewelry. Africans are teaching this to their children. They're mixing with African women. The African women are teaching their kids. This is how you get these people calling themselves Jews. But then when we go look into it, we can't find Yahweh worship nowhere prior to them getting there. I'm going to deal with all of that. Now, mind you, he's talking about in the 17th century. Well, look at this here, the main article, History of Jews in Morocco. See that black man right there? That's a black Jew. That man is a black Jew. Etching of Jewish home in Madagascar, Durindia, 1807-1841. Said Moroccan Jews constitute an ancient community immigrating to the region as early as 70 A.D. That just, he said that, Chris Harris just said that there was no Jews there prior to 1700. Moroccan Jews constituted an ancient community immigrating to the region as early as 70 A.D. I was listening to Yasha the Israel, right? And the information that he was putting forth, right? I was really listening um, to the information that he was putting forth. And as I was listening to it, I was just like, wow, when is he going to get to the point where debunk anything that I said? So, Moroccan Jews constitute an ancient community immigrating to the region as early as 70 A.D. Emily Gottwright contends that Jewish migration to Morocco predated the full formation of Judaism. It predated the full formation of Judaism. Jewish migration to Morocco did. As the Talmud was written and redacted between 200 and 500 B.C., E., in accordance with the norms of the Islamic legal system, excuse me, that's 200 to 500 CE, in accordance with the norms of the Islamic legal system, Jewish Moroccans had separate legal courts pertaining to personal law under which communities, Muslim Sharia, Christian canon law, and Jewish Halakha law abiding, were allowed to rule themselves under their own system. More proof by Emily Gottwright. She said, it is possible that some Jews fled into North Africa after the destruction of the first temple, first temple in the 6th century BCE, or the destruction of the second temple in the 1st century CE. It is also Second Temple in the uh, uh, in the first century CE. It is also possible that they arrived on Phoenician boats, fifteen hundred BC, Chris, to five thirty nine BCE. There is also a theory supported by Ibn Khaldun that the Moroccan Berbers were indigenous Amazigh Berbers who converted to Judaism. Although the question of who converted them remains. Again, Ibn Khaldun said that these Moroccan Jews were indigenous Amazigh Berbers and who converted to them to Judaism, although the question of who converted them remains. And this theory has been rejected by most scholars, meaning the theory that the Jews were converts has been rejected by most scholars, okay? So if you're thinking that these Jews in West Africa were converts, then you are not amongst the league of most scholars. You're more so in league with the ignorant. The Jewish communities of Ephraim from the Tamazite 
word Afri, meaning caravan, is supported to date back to 631 BCE and is believed to be the oldest Jewish community in what is now Morocco, dating back to 361 BCE. The first irrefutable evidence of the Jews in what is now Morocco is the form of gravestone epithets in Hebrew at Volabulus, and the ruins of the 3rd century synagogue date back to the late antiquity. Emily Gottwright contends that Jewish migration to Morocco predates the full formation of Judaism, as the Talmud was written and redacted between 200 and 500 BCE. The Hebrew or Aramaic language used by the Jews were closely related to the Punic language of the Carthaginians. Many Jews also settled amongst Berbers and adopted their languages later under the dominion of the Romans and later the Vandals. Mauritania Jews reportedly increased in number and prospered. Here I'm going to be looking into the ruins of Volovilus, okay, the grave epithets in ancient Morocco that I challenged Chris Harris on when he said that they were the, the Jews hadn't been there prior to the 1700s. But earlier in the same video, and I should post it, he said that they was there prior to that, so he contradicts his own self. He just talks in circles and talks stupid. But these are the ruins of Volabilis. Take a look at the ruins of Volabilis. Are they going to give us any pictures here? These are the ruins of Volabilis, the grave epithets that are written in Hebrew, that has been in Morocco way back in the Roman days, okay, way back in the B.C. time, all right, all the way up to like 200 B.C. up to possibly the 20-something C.E. era, all right, back on out of that. should have made it bigger so you could see it. I'll go back to it so you could take a look at it. What we have here. Some more grave inscriptions. same photos make them a little bigger so you can see that these are Hebrew writings the Hebrew inscriptions okay these are from the ruins of Volobolus all right what we have here Cemeteries. down here. My phone is acting a little wacko. It's doing what it want to do, so we're going to
Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. Ancient gravestones in the cemetery at Ifran bear witness to the existence of Jews here for many a century. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. Ancient gravestones in the cemetery at Ifran bear witness to the existence of Jews here for many a century. She has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. Ancient gravestones in the cemetery at Ifran bear witness to the existence of Jews here for many a century. Gravestones in the cemetery at Ifran bear witness to the existence of Jews here for many a century. I got to move on, brother. Peace. Thank you for calling. Well, that information cut him, don't it? That information you know, cut him, uh, boy. <laughs> Peace and Black Power family. What's your name? Where you calling from? Michigan. This is Yasha Ben Israel from Detroit. Oh, shit. Uh-oh. Yasha Ben Israel. I see you see your name in the title. What's going on, brother? Oh, oh yeah. I just got a statement that I like to say, uh, give a little critique. Uh, he did a he did a very very calm dissertation, but it was still full of logical fallacies and it was full of lots of conjecture. And his sources was his his sources used a lot. Whoever wrote that book used lots of conjecture. Okay. Uh, before I say this, Chris likes to use the uh, appeal to authority thing, but it is important to note that. Before he to use this uh, appeal to authority fallacy, it should not be used to dismiss claims of experts and scientific consensus. All right, an appeal to authority are not valid arguments, nor but it is reasonable to disregard. It is not reasonable to disregard the claim of experts who have demonstrated depths of knowledge. Unless it is one who has a similar level of understanding. Now, his people that he used don't have the same similar level of understanding that I use because we don't know who exactly his sources is. But Emily Gottreich, which is the professor of UC Berkeley in Jewish studies, Islamic studies, Middle Eastern studies, and North African history, she said that there's a theory supported by Ibn Khaldun that Moroccan Jews were converts. But the question remains who converted them. She said this is a theory that is rejected by most scholars. 
All right. Now he when he talk about these these Portuguese that mixed in with these blacks, he is is, is using that as if though it was an illusion that these uh, Portuguese people were white people. When in fact these Portuguese were Jews and not Europeans. They were not the descendants of Isabella and Ferdinand, the Gauls, the the, uh, the Franks who came down into that land in 1492. They are, uh, these people were Jewish converts, which were black folks that were looked at as Saracens and Hagarines, black folks of the Moorish Empire. Yeah, All right? Amazing. And he said that the show that Jews had been in that area uh, in Africa prior to uh, the Amhara Decree. But there's gravestone evidence evidence in Hebrew in the in the ruins of Valobolus right there. Oh, in, uh, oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. What's your question? What are What's you talking your question, about? Uh, my question is, uh, if there's grave if, if there's gravestone evidence in the ruins of Valobolus, how could you say that the uh, the Jews got there? Uh, after 1492, when when the uh, when the Volovilus Ephesus go back to like 4 BC to 28 AD, and these are grave epithets that are written in Hebrew in Morocco. Okay, um, so that's, that's, that's question number that's question number one, and I got one more question, question for you. Let me, hold on, let me ask you question number one. First of all, question number one um, is uh, argument from ignorance. I'm going to explain to you why. I was discussing as early as the 13th century that came into Africa participating. The number one um, is an uh, argument from ignorance. I'm going to explain to you why. I was discussing the Portuguese uh, period from as early as the 13th century that came into Africa participating in the slave trade in the Congo and how they manufactured and started converting African slaves. And they made the slaves their servants in Amsterdam and those same people began to participate in Jewelry. You have not acknowledged that. What you are now coming on here trying to do is move the needle and talk about something totally different. Acknowledge that. What you are now coming on here trying to do is move the needle and talk about something totally different. Then you said I appeal to Fala to um, Fala. Uh, I'm appealing to authority, but yet this was a scholastic rebuttal to the information that you presented because you used Tudor Parfait's work, and you actually mispronounced his name by saying Parfait Tudor. Um, that doesn't make that the argument from at ignorantium, Chris Harris. That does not make that the argument from ignorance. And you constantly get on here and lie and say, I haven't proved anything wrong that you said. Let me show you what the classic argument from ignorance is so you can be informed. Fascinating. Now, there's a fascinating frailty of the human mind that psychologists know all about and it's called argument from ignorance and this is how it goes you ready somebody sees lights flashing in the sky they've never seen it before they don't understand what it is they say a ufo the u stands for unidentified so they say i don't know what it is it must be aliens from outer space visiting from another planet. Well, if you don't know what it is, that's where your conversation should stop. You don't then say, it must be anything. Okay? That's what argument from ignorance is. It's common. I'm not blaming anybody. Psychologists know all about it, and it may relate to our burning need to have to know stuff because we're uncomfortable steeped in ignorance. You can't be a scientist if you're uncomfortable with ignorance because we live at the boundary between what is known and unknown in the universe. All right, so the argument. All right, so the argument from ignorance is when you arguing about something that you do not know what you're talking about. I know exactly what I'm talking about, and if I didn't, I had scholarly sources that knew exactly what they were talking about. 
So therefore, that was not an appeal to ignorance. Neither was it an appeal to an authority. This guy doesn't know what the appeal to ignorance is. The appeal to ignorance is when you begin to talk and to make a plea from a case, from a place where you have no evidence. You're making a case from a place that you have no evidence. If there's no evidence, then you make no case. If there's if from a place of ignorance, if you have no evidence or no facts or no knowledge, and you're making a plea from that particular case, then that's the argument from ignorance, and that is what I have not done. In fact, the argument from ignorance itself is done in Chris Harris as he's making a two-hour presentation about black, about Jews, the Portuguese Jews, and are very ignorant of the fact that they were both black and uh, African people. Just like the presentation that he said that these people were acting as Portuguese, which was something that they were not or should not have been doing. An appeal to ignorance is a type of informal fallacy that arises when an argument is taken as true because it has not been proven to be false. Not that shit Chris or about. an argument is false because it has not been proven to be true. Not that shit Chris was talking about. Put differently, in an appeal to ignorance fallacy, the arguer claims that some statement P is true because someone failed to prove that P is false. Not that or statement P about. is false because no one has proven that it is true. Not that shit Chris was talking about. Hence, in each case, the lack of evidence or proof that P is true or false is used as a reason for concluding that P is true or false. The form of an appeal to ignorance fallacy looks like this. We do not know that P is false. Therefore, P must be true. Or, we do not know that P is true. Therefore, P must be false. This is not the kind of argument <laughs> that I gave Chris here. <laughs> I told Chris Harris that he was uh, uh, not to use the appeal to logic, logical fallacy, and that if there was no grave sites, I mean, if there was no uh, Jews in Africa prior to the 7th century, then why do we have the voluminous grave site markings? That's not an appeal to ignorance. Chris is stupid and he's foolish. listening to Yasha bin Israel, right? And the information that he was putting forth, right? I was really listening um, to the information that he was putting forth. And as I was listening to it, I was just like, wow, when is he going to get to the point where debunk anything that I said? Educational purposes. Teach you how to spot a gas lighter. Check out the link in this video description to learn more about that. But in this video, we're talking about gaslighting. Yeah. What is that? So gaslighting is a form of emotional abuse. It's where a person doubts the reality of another person, leaving that other person very, very confused. Mm -hmm. Gaslighting is sort of a signature tool of the narcissist, and they're often engaging in it to protect their fragile egos, to keep the world in line with their own reality, with little regard of how much it hurts another person when we doubt theirs. So again, it's very much a tool of manipulation, of emotional abuse, of again, second guessing someone else's reality. And there it is, people. There it is. Educational purposes. Teach you how to spot a gas lighter. Check out.
check out the link in this video description to learn more about that. But in this video, we're talking about gaslighting. Yeah. What is that? So gaslighting is a form of emotional abuse. It's where a person doubts the reality of another person, leaving that other person very, very confused. Mm -hmm. Gaslighting is sort of a signature tool of the narcissist, and they're often engaging in it to protect their fragile egos, to keep the world in line with their own reality, with little regard of how much it hurts another person when we doubt theirs. So again, it's very much a tool of manipulation, of emotional abuse, of again, second-guessing someone else's reality. And